Welcome back. In this episode, we're gonna get the look of shear strike on. Uh, before we can do that, we get a little bit of prep work to do now that the staging is out of the way. And in real time, we are about ready to put in the whiskey plank. So if you are in the area this weekend, Saturday the 28th, uh, and you are free sometime between two and seven, stop on by. Ken's gonna be here with his barbecue rig. We're gonna do a bunch of pulled pork, uh, and we're gonna put in the whiskey plank, the last plank on the boat. If you can't join us here in person, we're gonna be going live uh, at two o'clock until whenever the whiskey plank is in. Uh, that, there's a link to that in below in the description. Uh, so you can click on that and that'll take you to the live at two o'clock. Uh, and if you stay till the end of the video, uh, we've got a little memorial, so to speak, for Pat Akin, uh, who's, she is related to William and John Akin, who are the designers of the Ingrid and Stormy Petrel, which we are building. And Pat is the one that I've communicated with through the years for getting the plans uh, for Arabella, as well as the plans for the Tender. Unfortunately, Pat has passed away. Um, so we'll talk about a little that more at the end of the video. So thanks for coming and joining, and uh, we'll see you here every Friday. As Steve said, in this episode, the starboard shear straight gets fastened to Arabella. But first, a few things need to happen before the final bronze screw goes in. So KP and George did an awesome job getting the staging cut back, and now we're ready to get to work. So as a reminder, this top cedar here and this strip of oak with the deck screws in it, that's all temporary and it's going to get cut off. And we're gonna put the shear strake on so that the top of the shear strake is just a little bit higher than the deck beams here. So that when we put the covering board on, we can fare the shear strake and make all of that come in together. So what we need to do before we can put the last, plank, last planks in here, starting with the shear strake, is we have to go and cut back any of these deck beams that are long. So you can see it's gonna make fitting the plank a little tricky. We need to clean up any of the dolphinite from bedding the lower planks that we haven't got to yet. So KP and I are just going to walk down right now from stem to stern and get all of these deck beams cut back, get the dolphinite cleaned up, get the bronze straps let in, pop in the last couple of remaining bolts that we have to do, and then we'll be able to haul in the shear strake and get fitting that. Once the shear strake's on, we'll be able to cut these top pieces back, but we want to leave those supporting the frame ends until the shear strake goes in. We gotta let this bronze strap into the frame here, which means I need to be able to get the strap out, which means I gotta remove this or cut this. And I wanna make sure that this is here and helping to support the shape of the frames so that when we put the shear strake on, all of these frame ends are pulled in and they're in the proper shape they wanna be. So we've got a board here and I'm gonna bend that in on the inside of the frames and screw it. And then I'll just cut out the couple sections that I need to let the straps out. And this will keep the shape of the boat here and make sure that this is all rigid when we go to put the shear strake on. And this one having being clamped under the inside won't be in our way.
One down. One, two, three, four, five, six, 20 seven, to go. eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, something. Twenty to go. Yeah, something like that. We can't really get in there with a sawzall. And definitely not Steve's multi-tool, the chainsaw. It'd be tight, but I wouldn't want to risk it with the chainsaw. I think the multi, it's going to be a little slow, but I think the multi-tool is the way to go. Yeah. Okay. That one was fairly tight. This one's going to be easier. Oh, yeah. That All would right. be easier. Okay. This one here has got, you got way more wiggle room around it. Outside, Andrew Guest from Restoring Rosalind was still working on getting one of his steam generators operational enough to use for the remaining planking. Exciting. <laughs> it works. Yeah, we weren't quite getting like real hot, wet steam yet. But no, I think the water needs to be dialed down a hair. Um, All right, what do you need? A little welding job if you can. Yeah, oh, this is for your gauge. gauge. Okay. You know, right up on top like that. Okay. Today, tomorrow, next week. Yeah. One guy here for next weekend would be good. Cool. I'll go set it in front of the drive door. You got it. Thank you, kind sir. Appreciate it. Of course. Yeah, we can ask. Andrew's got some more O-rings, and he thinks he might have figured out like where he was going awry with them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he was playing with that yesterday, and then he thinks that maybe he um, turned it down too much, and then maybe flooded it because he was trying to get it to go, and it wouldn't. Um, I don't know. He's he's out there tinkering with it now, and I got to. Uh, I got a motor if I'm going to have be on track for the whiskey plank on the 28th. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be good. Alright, thanks Angus. So, yeah, we've been trying to get this old uh, Dayton industrial steam cleaner working because uh, it will be very good for steaming planks and uh, all sorts of things. It, it just generates enormous amount of steam when it works. Yeah, so um, you've had it operating before. We have, yeah. Okay, well, that's uh, good. We had it running for, I don't know, five, ten minutes, something like that, and it was, it was a lot. Um, okay. But uh, the pump keeps stopping working. I just had an issue with the connections for this, the uh, transformer had come undone, so we uh -huh. were getting an arc. Now it seems that the regulator valve in the pump is stuck too far open, so mm -hmm. it's putting too much diesel out. And right. Because the valve is stuck, like, I keep having to take it's not the best design in terms of adjustment. You have to take the pump completely off, disconnect it in order to adjust the regulator, and then yeah, yeah, put that, it back that, on. That bleed is it. a bad design. Like, because it's on the back. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. And you can't see it from the other side. But, um, I can moonlight as a boiler technician as well. So that's good. On the job training. Okay, 
George, I got this. You run around. Pause. Hold that. The staging that we cut back was in the way from putting the planks on, but it was also in the way for putting in some of the bolts. So you can see that most of them have two 3 8 carriage bolts that go through, and one of those bolts goes through the oak clamp, and one of them goes through the locust shelf, and that helped ties that all together. And what that locust <coughs> shelf and that oak clamp do is they're really what connects the hull of the boat to the deck of the boat and makes sure that that's a really strong junction. So this is a spot here, I have it labeled with blue tape and bolts, uh, that when the staging was here, I just couldn't get in here to drill. These ones I could come in from below and get. And then the other thing I did is let in the bronze straps. And in some places, it wasn't the staging that was preventing from putting in the bolts, uh, it was the bronze strap, and the staging was stopping the bronze strap from coming out. So now we got to drill through here and put in our bolts through the shelf and through the clamp and counterbore those, get this painted. And you can see that now the bronze strap lays nice and flat in there. And I did that with the little palm router. Easy peasy, nothing too difficult there. So KP and I are going to go through and we're going to pop in these bolts. And as you can see, we've got the shear strike here and it's about ready to start fighting that locust into place. I can go ahead and counter bore that though, right? The one that came through? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's oh, good. Battery. That's good. Just got to go far enough that the head disappears. So okay. that's plenty, good. plenty, plenty Great. deep. This lower one should be a five. Yeah, it's a, yep. And then I don't know what the longer one's going to want to be. Oh, it's been a while since I've done some work on a rabbit. Uh, I spent this morning cleaning up the frames here and extending the rabbit. 
So we did the rabbit work pretty much with the chisel and the mallet. And on the sawn frames here, I used the adds, the angle grinder with the flap disc, and the spoke shaves. And this is all really close with the batten. Uh, but one thing I found is that these locust planks bend ever so slightly differently than that light batten does. So these are really close. I would say like 90, 95% of the way there. And anything above here is getting cut off. Um, so didn't have to worry about these screws. Don't have to worry about this rabbit. I just want to be able to tuck the plank in here. And then I'll use the plank itself as that final guide. And we'll bend the plank in. I'll see what we need to do to the sawn frames and the rabbit. Do that last five to 10% of work that needs to be done. Fair out between whatever that work is and the cedar. Uh, and we'll be ready to put the plank on. With Andrew still tinkering on his own machines, Steve broke out the old trusty turkey fryer to steam the ends of the shear strake. And Steve needed a system that he could leave semi unattended anyway because over the next two days, the boathouse was visited by a couple of news crews with their own cameras. How long do you think you're going to be out there? Is this, you know, the rest of your life is sailing that's, around the world? That's the plan. Yep. Really? Okay. Never coming back to dry land? or? Oh, we'll see. I mean, maybe I'll hate it and I'll sell the boat and go do something else, but I doubt it. Well, we got it partially installed. Yeah, it's coming along. So <laughs> the last couple days we got set up to steam, and just as we did, um, some local news channels came. They're going to do a couple little pieces about the project, which is super cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but it means that we didn't actually get any footage of us doing the steaming. <laughs> <laughs> they got footage of us doing the steaming. It exists. It exists. We don't have it to show. Um, but we're going to steam the stern ends of the two seaters below it, and we'll make sure we get that, especially when we do that whiskey next week. Um, so at this point, it's steamed and the fight has been taken out of it. It's clamped where we want it to be. So at this point, KP and I need to go through and mark the top and bottom edge of the plank so that we can put it back in exactly the same spot it is now. And we got to figure out what we need to do for backing out so that it fits tightly to the frames. Mm -hmm. But people signed the shear strake and I totally forgot about backing out the shear strake before people signed it. So, is a very easy fix to this. Um, there's not much shape up here at the boat, so we're just gonna dub the frames ever so slightly so that the plank sits flush on there. I, looking at it as we went down, I think at most we're talking about a 16th of an inch off that two and a half inch frame. If that. If that, it's, it's not really anything. And that way we can preserve all of the signatures. Uh, but I think down the road it might be funny, they'll take the planks off the boat and be like, these two planks weren't backed out and the rest of them were. Right, right. But they're covered Why? in signatures and notes. Oh, I see. Okay. Where are we now? Here? This one's tight. Yeah. Oh, it's super tight. That one's beautiful. We might flatten this. FS, this is an FS. FS, flatten slightly. Yeah. Flatten slightly. That's an F. Oh. oh, you guys want to help us take this off? Yeah.
What's real fun is getting back behind there, scraping the dolphin head out after you put the plank on. Ugh. It's really not that bad. If you uh, if you let the dolphinite kind of gel over. Oh, and you can. Yeah, there's a there's a magic window. It's like I mean, it's a couple days long, but okay. like you don't do it that day. <laughs> You right, and then you just smear it everywhere. Where, yeah, you, and then you don't want to do it a month later. It's like too hard. Yeah, give okay. it give it a couple days, and it kind of skims over a little bit. Yeah. Whatever we can gather from the front or easily, we'll just move down and use again. Whatever we can't get too easily, we'll just kind of wait a little bit. Okay. Now, inquiring minds probably want to know, yes. why did you chop the rabbit higher than the plank goes? Because when we fit it, we fit it high, so that we, which means if we're high, then when we trim the end of the plank, we trim it a little bit long and then sneak back on it. So I spent all day yesterday making cuts smaller than this. This was my big cut first thing in the morning. This was my second cut. And every subsequent cut to get that long was dust. <laughs> so making it high means you can sneak up on it. So two planks left, both cedars. And then number two is gonna be our whiskey plank. Write that in. And that is in one week's time from now. May 28th. I often get asked how I picked the Ingrid to build uh, out of all of the boats, you know, all the plans that exist in the world. And my answer is that when I was looking at boats, I learned pretty quickly that picking a specific boat would be like trying to pick a car to build from scratch if you had every make, model, manufacturer throughout all of eternity to pick from. You know, it's an insane amount of vehicles and it's even worse with boats. Uh, and what I realized was that I was better off to find a designer and then look through that designer's catalog because any solid designer would have a boat that would fit what I was looking for uh, in terms of a vessel to build and sail and live on. And when I was researching designers, you know, Harishoff, Alden, Bueller, um, Sparkman Stevens, you know, all these famous names came up, and among those was Akin. And when I started researching the individual designers, 
it was really interesting to see their different ethos and who they were designing boats for and, and their goals with all the boats because every designer has a little bit of a, a different niche and take on, on what they're doing. And the Atkins motto, tagline, whatever you want to call it, was um, individualized designs for unregimented yachtsmen. I was like, I'm, I'm pretty unregimented, this fits. And then looking through their catalog, I came across the Ingrid and Atkin described her as ableness personified and equal to any situation and a boat that could handle herself in rough weather. She's based off the Norwegian lifeboats from back in the day. Uh, so solid, seaworthy vessel. And the Atkins, they designed boats for the amateur home builder. That was their market. Um, they designed boats that were just solid and stable and um, relatively simple, not the flashiest in town. And that's exactly what I was looking for, being an amateur builder, something that a designer had me in mind when they designed the boat. Uh, and then the next big hurdle once you pick a boat and a design is how do you get your hands on the plans? And thankfully, the Atkin plans have been curated and maintained by Pat Atkin, who recently passed away. So there was William Atkin and his son John, and John's wife was Pat. William and John passed away some years ago, um, but Pat Atkin has steadfastly made sure that the plans are available uh, at a very reasonable rate. And when I reached out and asked for the plans for the Ingrid, she sent them. And uh, when I got wind that there was a gaff rig version that was once drawn, Pat dug through the plans and found Stormy Petrol and sent me the sale plans for that and sent us the plans for the tenders. Uh, and when we did our 200th episode, we actually got a letter from Pat, which I would like to quickly share. Dear Steve, Ann, Ben, and the rest of the Acorn to Arabella crew, I wanted to send a quick congratulatory note on the amazing progress you've achieved in building Arabella. I remember seeing your video of the keel pour back in 2017. At the time, I thought you were a bit crazy to build a large design like Ingrid as a first project, and inland no less. I usually counsel new boat builders to try a small dinghy first before jumping into a catch. I am delighted to say how wrong I was and have eagerly anticipated a new video every Friday to view the amazing progress you have done in building Arabella. The amount of detail and love you have put into the boat would no doubt have made William and John proud of your work. Keep up the good work and I can't wait to see Arabella setting sail. And it was so wonderful to, to get that letter from Pat. And she shared the videos every Friday on Facebook. Uh, I never got to meet her in person. I never actually spoke to her on the phone. It was all through email. But she was always very delightful. And I'm incredibly thankful that she kept William and John's work available uh, and that I was fortunate enough to communicate with her. And I'm very sorry and sad that she's not going to be around on launch day. Um, so thankfully, the Atkins Pat worked with Mystic Seaport, and they are going to make the plans available. Um, so they are working on that, and they will be available again. I'm thrilled that other people will have the chance to build one of these beauties if they want. Uh, and thank you, Pat, for, for everything. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, may you rest in peace. Pat Atkin was a painter, potter, art teacher, sailor, and torchbearer who died on Sunday, May 15th at age 94. She has managed the catalog and legacy of over 300 boat plans that William Atkin and John Atkin, her late husband, designed, and for which the family name became famous in the maritime world. Arabella, an Ingrid that will have a stormy petrels rig, was designed by William. Her prize-winning pottery is warm and evocative of nature ranging from useful vessels to abstract sculpture in playful and experimental ways. She loved the serendipity of the changing colors of glaze in the heat of a kiln, and she passed that passion to her students and other artists over the many years she taught and volunteered. We will miss her at launch, and we will always treasure her counsel and encouragement. We can't express fully what it meant to read her thoughts about what William and John's take would be about her endeavor, except to say that there are a great many builders who never come to know what the thoughts might be of the people who design what they build. She is a woman who inspired many through her teaching and through her caretaking of the Atkin legacy. Eight bells for Pat Atkin.
I can tell you this, last Memorial Day weekend, cold, rainy in the 40s, I can almost guarantee it's going to be a lot better than that this time around. Shane and Jessica? That's good news. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, out in the Western Mass town of Granby, there is a story of a boat builder and a dream. Yeah, the dream started six years ago, although some of the trees being used to build the boat were first planted by the builder's great-great-grandfather more than 100 mm. years ago. Doug Nian takes us from Acorn to Arabella in tonight's Meet in Mass. I don't know if I call myself a shipbuilder, but I'm a carpenter and a woodworker. You could say Stephen Dinette of Granby is also a dreamer and a visionary. His dream, to hand build a sailboat with the vision of sailing her to destinations around the world. You usually tell me I'm crazy. <laughs> Are you crazy? <laughs> well, I mean, you gotta be a little crazy to quit your full-time job and cash in your meager retirement savings and go all in on something like this, but... I don't know. Here we are.